Uh, so this session will be um, Patricia Huaita, Nabil Mohareb, and Hannah LaRue. Um, I'm hoping they are all online and ready to roll. Um, and that's the order that um, they're presented here in the schedule. Um, so I'm going to ask them to proceed. And when Patricia's finished, we'll go straight to Nabil, and then we'll go to Hannah, and then we'll have the, the Q&A. So over to you, Patricia. And if, if you can introduce yourself, uh, if it's not a pre-recorded. I have to say that I, I am extremely happy to be here. And thank you very much for the kind invitation to be part of this great collective effort with all these inspiring contributions that records the important achievements of the global architecture pedagogy. In the presentation, I just want to outline different aspects and concepts that help us to construct the chapter that I'm going to present. And I really am very extremely also happy to be part of this four section that is about hybrids, because I think it's, uh, it's very inspiring, Harriet, uh, the presentation and, and, and market that you have done. Well, let's, uh, let's begin with this uh, chapter, El Portico de los Huéspedes, exploring other ways of building at the open city in Valparaíso, Chile. We can go ahead. Well, I have to say thank you to all the, the people and institutions that, that help us to develop uh, this, this program that we have done from 2014 till 2019. It was ended a little bit by, by the COVID. But I have to say that at the beginning, this um, experiment that we have done between Switzerland and uh, Chile, it was totally out of the curriculum and it was really on voluntary basis. You can go ahead. But, but it's true that at the end, we arrive uh, to find some foundations from the external uh, part and also at, at the end, the university, both universities really, really ha help us. Can you please go ahead? Yes. So. In the summer of 2014, with the students from the three Swiss schools of architecture, we began to work on a research project on the Pacific coast of Chile, at the open city. We were interested in creating a context, an hybrid context, that would make it possible to research on architecture through the pedagogy of making. You can go ahead. To contextualize this collaborative work, this chapter starts with the outline of the origins of Valparaiso School. You can go ahead. And then it reflects on the project working methods, what we were looking for. First of all, we wanted to build up a tacit and embodied knowledge through a process of construction that links drawing to fabrication and involves the students from Switzerland and from Chile in a cyclical process of design that is critically engaged with the material, human, temporal realities of building that connects place, community and the environment. In the open city, we found this context to address these questions through the incremental development of El Portico that is, at the same time, the, the, the work that we have done, it's an atelier, it was a chantier, and also a pedagogical tool. You can go ahead. Well, let's begin with the open city, what, uh, what we surely can say. You can, you can go ahead, thank you. Well, the, lo, it's located on the dunes, for those that, that they don't know, uh, of Ritoque, north of Valparaiso in Chile. And, and it begins from the need of its founders to have a space where life, work and study can coexist, a place born of encounter between poetry and a diversity of crafts. You can go ahead. Built with precariousness, the open city is composed of structures developed in an organic way. Each of its, its constructions is part of a continuous process, like a living organism by creation and a collective life. You can go ahead. The intention was to design 
open building in the sense that architects, craftsmen and inhabitants both together, all together, are part of the development and the interventions over the time. What is built must therefore be in direct dialogue with nature. You can go ahead. Buildings are placed by reading the geographical dimension of the place. The ground that touches the building is the natural terrain. This is done in such a way that both the built and the natural are preserved. So if the work were to disappear over the years, the dune land would return to its original status. You can continue. The buildings are constructed using self-building techniques and modest lightweight materials such as wood, masonry, and in this choice of ephemeral materials, there is a celebration of temporality and mobility and the prelevance of nature over the ivories of the human being. You can go ahead. So we could think of the architecture of the open city as a garden. This is a way how we really uh, understood uh, this beautiful place before going, no? that buildings change their morphology over the time, which incorporate layers of thickness and which are caring of each other. I think this world about care was very nice, very inspiring for us. A construction that is light in its extension, which without the care of its inhabitants, once again disappears. You can go ahead. So now let's talk about what we have done uh, when we arrived there in 2014 and how we transform this pedagogy and try to, to be very actual and very um, uh, contemporary of what we think that we, we, we need to do with, with our students. You can go ahead. So it's important that just to have this phrase, it's not from architects, it's from biologists. It's not possible to know something un unless you make it. It means that for creating knowledge, we really have to do it. We really have to experiment. We really have to have these uh, immersive uh, ideas. You can go ahead. So what we have done, the students who have participated in this workshop every year, we, they were invited to experience a led learning processes where structures are designed collectively from fragments related to constructive, creative and sensory practice, looking for a new affective ecology of pedagogy. It took place every year for four weeks, you can go ahead, with exclusive dedication and allows architecture students from Chile and from um, Switzerland and also since 2016 engineering students to access to the design and construction of an incremental project on real scale. A scale sorry, you can go ahead. So the students that were trained in um, new technologies were immersed in craft, low-tech context to which they are not accustomed. They were in situ, outdoor, exposed to the winter, uh, in Chile, and the emphasis is on the acquisition of this tacit knowledge based on direct experience, a rhythm of action that involves the immersion of the students in reiterative handmade process. You can go ahead. And now uh, we are, I'm going to present very briefly, not the, the, the sequences that we have built, you know, more like trying to convince in five different actions that help us, uh, these actions we were building during the, the construction of, of the Portico, and it helped us to work a small methodology that uh, it was also translated in the future in different, in different projects. You can continue. So let's go for the physical transformation. Go ahead. Uh, I have to say that the, the idea of the physical transformation we took in a fragment, uh, uh, in, in this case, was the roof of Goodner Asplund Woodland Chapel. As a gallery for the construction of the initial volumetry of the portico, the main elements of the roof, and we built it in, in totally other materials within assembled wooden boards that we 
took uh, a, from another chantier, radically transform and, and we just rebuild the, the geometry. No, you can continue. So the development of the constructive details and assembly principles initiated on iterative exploration where design and architecture construction were linking into a cyclical process and it was all the time transformed. The project was not never understood as a linear development, but a, a process capable of having improvisation. Elements can replace if they were uh, old and um, they transform all the time themselves. You can continue. Now the, the second idea or the second action like observation. You can go ahead. We are understood that each inter in each intervention is the result of an observation and careful reading of the construction in its current states. In this way, the project can include different contributions. So there is not an author. So each person guided by their own reading of the common project can really have a new ideas. You can continue. It means there is not an author and uh, there is not uh, a clear uh, plan of, of all the chantier. No? In this context, for example, with this image, between the first and the second year, the Chilean students team intervened by building a constellation of 10 concrete columns made in situ with a flexible formwork system. The columns were disseminated around the portico, creating a new special spatial sequences in dialogue with the existing landscape. And when we arrived to, <laughs> to Chile the second year, we found this fantastic intervention that, that really helped us to, to continue. Go ahead. Drawing as an experience. You can go. So the idea of the drawing, of the introduction of a hand drawing, because we were in the middle of the desert and we cannot work with computers. It was simply like this. It's not a technique of representation, sino a mediator between construction and the students. In this way, the drawing becomes like a memory that passes through all the generation of students that come to the chantier and accumulates the experience. Hand drawing, you can continue, is a physical and a special action that allows to observe, measure and construct to see. Drawing can have depth, continue, made an iterative layers that accumulate many construction strata and temporalities. Hand drawing is constantly a present in a fragile and changeable way. Continue. The, the four was construction in situ. What give us now in the present uh, to the students to construct? Working on a real scale allows the generation of material awareness. The students felt able to modify, transform and intervene in the construction site. So the construction is not anymore uh, an abstract reality that is only in the computer or with, with um, in very, very far away from us. Continue. Moreover, the use of rudimentary tools that we really, some of them found uh, uh, in Valparaíso, question the relation between what we are and what we produce. It makes us aware of the time we need to work with different materials and respect their essence. The students integrated into design the importance of the articulation of constructive details and the relation with the landscape. Continue. And at the end, what we have done uh, as the project was in a way this superposition of fragments. You can continue. The project then is constructed with multiple fragments by many hands, weaving together a multiplicity of skills and also sharing different cultures in a collaborative effort. By constructing their own personal work, the students develop a sense of appropriateness of means. You can continue. The constructed fragment become a new instrument for observing and measuring the landscape on the site and connecting the student with the real. 
with a real community, no? The fragments act as mediator between the detail, the intimate elements, and the overall project, showing traces all the time of the war and the construction at, and about the time that is passing, no? Each participant is able to grasp the intensity and fragility of the construction, experiencing the temporality and memory of it. Just to finish for the conclusions, you can go ahead. I have to say that over these past six years, our research work in the open city has made possible to give students the opportunity to engage in a unique cultural setting for uh, in practice learning, an experience of collaborative building that touches upon some of architecture's most fundamental concerns. You can pass. Resilient constructions, economies of materials, rooted the relationship with the planes and the understanding of the community. And with the making, through the making, we construct the design process itself. So the context of the open city provokes uh, the cognition in uh, experiential learning and implicate a transformative experience where body, craft and nature are in synergy. This experience can contribute to develop a particular concerns between the context, the human sensory experience and the relation between care in the making and the space produced is revealed. I think we have to, you can continue we just really have to continue exploring other forms of building that questions the relation between what we do, what we are. And just to finish, I have to say to, that uh, thank you very much. You, could, you can uh, the, ah, you say the end because I think I did it. I put it la last night, but I have to say that this article personally helped me so much because I, I just present my PhD last Friday experience in architecture, materiality and embodied in the technological era. And I included this research into my PhD. So thank you very much for, for this great book that is super inspiring. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patricia. Yeah, a fascinating presentation. Um, and just a reminder for those of you that are online, if you have any questions, about Patricia's presentation or any comments. If you could share it in the chat, Botamello is gonna capture them and at the end, um, we'll be able to, to um, pose those questions to Patricia and, and, and hear her thoughts and her response. So the next presentation we have is from Nabil Mohareb, um, which is also an online presentation. I hope that Nabil yes, is I'm here. lined up. Yes, I'm here. Yes, I welcome, yeah. welcome Nabil. I think we're gonna be move, moving to the screen to see you shortly. Nabil, perhaps you could just introduce yourself to the audience and where you are and yes. with whom you're affiliated yes. while we wait yes. for them to talk. Uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon, and it's really uh, a pleasure for me to be here with you. And uh, I would like to thank the editors, Harit, Ashraf Salam, and Ed for uh, their uh, guidance and help. And uh, I would like also to thank my co-author, Rena Yaman, who was a, a former student, and right now she's my colleague. Um, uh, my name is Nabil Harib and I'm Egyptian architect. I'm associate professor uh, from the American University in Cairo. And uh, the work I'm going to present is uh, the context is in Lebanon, as at that time I was uh, a head of faculty branch there in Lebanon. So it was uh, it's about design build. Our book chapter is about a design build approach addressing four community challenges in Tripoli, Lebanon. Uh, next slide, please. Well, actually, uh, we have started from this quotation by Jersey Devil, who stated that learning architecture over a drawing board alone would be like becoming a chemist by just reading and never actually mixing the chemical. Um, this is really true when we just trying to educate students uh, about uh, design, architecture, draw, uh, fascinated issues, even using virtual reality, augmented reality, but still uh, giving them the skills to build a real project, this is really a challenging part. So we have started, next please, next slide please. Uh, this is just the context of the projects that I'm going to present. It's in the north of Lebanon, a city uh, called Tripoli. And uh, next slide please. Yes. 
we we have started our, this experimental issue in our master of architecture and actually it is like a collaborative multidisciplinary uh, approach dealing with a number of courses number of disciplines all together are just equipped to help the students to gain skills in designing and building uh, a product so we thought about is it a product a small product bigger product a product so we have thought that it is better to be oriented to the community needs and actually involving with the community, learning from them, and we as a, uh, professors and students learning from their needs and trying to respond to them, it was really a challenging point. So next, please. So our first project or the first year, uh, by the way, Dam Ash is two semesters. So the design build project is uh, the first semester is completely devoted for research understanding the community needs, go uh, uh, within the sites, real sites, understand uh, uh, their uh, um, uh, options and all of these issues. And then the second semester is about implementation, using the full set of drawings and implementing using uh, local materials. So the first uh, challenge was about uh, establishing a temporary shelter of refugees because at 2014-2015, uh, it was the peak of uh, refugees from Syria to Lebanon and especially for Tripoli because it was a little bit cheaper city and uh, people are much more welcoming and they could involve more into the community. So we have visited one of uh, the uh, refugee camps and you can see uh, the shelters were not really providing any sort of at least the minimum requirement of uh, any living standards. So we thought that what if we build a, a refugee shelter that could give at least uh, uh, some uh, 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 sheltering from the environmental issues and the basic needs for uh, the users. So next, please. Next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of things that it was fascinating that the refugees themselves started to design, build their issues. I mean, their needs. This is like a, a small uh, a chair for a child. The parent just collected uh, raw materials and established this furniture. So starting from this point, we thought, OK, we need to have some sort of shelter that could be designed and the materials should be from the local materials without any uh, hard technologies. Anyone could assemble and disassemble this unit and it, it's going to be much more cheaper even than the one provided by UNHCR. Next uh, slide, please. So we have like two teams of uh, master of student architects and the first team have used uh, uh, pipes, sanitary pipes, uh, water pipes, and then uh, they've used the, the, the walls from uh, the fabric of the jeans uh, uh, trousers fabric and then trying to fill them with sand. And in, or, in order to give them, I mean, horizontality and verticality issues, we have used also plastic pipes. All of these materials were very cheap in Tripoli and could be located easily. Next slide, please. And uh, uh, actually, you have built the real scale unit, and uh, uh, this unit uh, had like a lot of prototypes at first and different scales of uh, uh, models until we have finalized this one of the prototypes. Next slide, please. The other prototype was basically based on a quick assemble and disassemble of the shelter and could have a number of units could be transported from one place to another using steel structure. And again, all the materials were local materials and actually our students fabricated uh, the majority of them with the help of civil engineering uh, students and professors. So it was just a collaboration of how to find the best shelter that could provide at the minimum uh, life requirements uh, for any refugees. Next, uh, next, please. And uh, within the first uh, semester, of course, the students have set uh, had the full set of drawings and uh, the bill of quantities, trying to approach suppliers, get the best uh, 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 prices for them, and negotiating things. So it's like it was like a mini uh, uh, a firm dealing with a real project that is really needed and going to be constructed. Next slide, next slide, please. Well, after we're finished, the students uh, sought an opportunity. Why not pushing uh, 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 things for a, a, a new horizon to be an entrepreneur and trying to participate in uh, uh, global competitions with these ideas? And uh, actually, we have won two 
the one the MIT Enterprise uh, Forum Panel are for refugees for two consecutive years for the two teams. Next slide, please. Well, the second project, the, the year after, we thought, OK, uh, Tripoli had a nice waterfront corniche, but actually half of it is being used and the other half is not used. And there's a, an electricity problem in Lebanon in general, and in particular in Tripoli, that the government just provides six hours electricity. So the rest of the day is just bas basically based on the generators and uh, private uh, 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 companies. So the Corniche is not led by night and there are a lot of street vendors there and trying to uh, earn their living. So we thought, why not we provide these street vendors with a unit that they could uh, uh, work on having an electricity off grid. And then when they finished their work, the unit itself became like a flower box or something which is uh, be part of the placemaking of the waterfront itself. The next slide, please. One of units just started from developing like a huge flower box was actually beneath of it all the equipments. And when they uh, uh, opened this flower box and using a wind turbulence to generate electricity enough to operate the small equipments needed for any street vendors to uh, uh, buy some goods or something or sorry, selling some goods or something. So it was operated and being tested. Next one, please. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, this is another example of the street vendor units. And actually, our students have just designed them, uh, executed them into real scale. Next, uh, next slide, please. And this is another third example. There were like three prototypes. Next slide, please. We thought, what if we just import a little bit of technology and move a little bit uh, from uh, the local community needs to another local community needs dealing with office uh, uh, buildings that uh, they were using like uh, uh, glass panels. They are not uh, cope with the code, so they have like a lot of uh, heat problems inside the building itself. We've developed a prototype that has been uh, uh, um, as a kinetic facade that is, works according to uh, the level of light uh, and according to they are rotated through the day to accommodate a better uh, a light and uh, they have just operated on uh, photovoltaics uh, uh, panels. Next slide, please. And this was this project was a challenge because really uh, as an architect, maybe we don't know a lot about mechatronics and all of this electrical issues. So we cooperated with other departments, other students, and uh, we have developed this prototype. Next slide, please. Well, we were blessed that by the end of the third year uh, of the masters of the third prototype that we have done, that we have been involved in uh, some sort of uh, funded project, uh, partially funded by the uh, uh, um, European uh, uh, group. And uh, this project was about our city, our way, a young uh, vision of Elmina city. Elmina is a, a partially historical uh, part of the city of uh, north of Tripoli. And actually, it was devoted for uh, trying to uh, give uh, uh, the the young or the uh, the um, youth uh, a vision, or uh, try to implement the vision of the youth into the city. Next slide, please. Well, this is the final result. This is the implementation part. It was one year a project. The left hand side it was before. The right hand side was an after. And as you can see, a lot of work has been done. And actually, we have selected 30 youth from Elmina. Uh, the uh, ages was like between 14 years old to 17 years old. And uh, we are just having the process using something called from zero dimension to seventh dimension, meaning trying to understand with them and learn with them the uh, skills of critical thinking, how to translate the ideas from the uh, uh, from the mind into a paper and into a, a design. Yeah, yeah. yeah sorry, uh, there's another voice there. OK, so uh, this was the project and uh, next slide, please. So if this was the team, team of uh, the professors or the advisors in addition to the youth. Next slide, please. 
And we have started with uh, trying to generate ideas like any design studio, but this time is devoted for non-architect students. So it was really a challenge how to uh, uh, listen to them, how to give them skills in order to uh, implement the ideas in reality. So I've passed with different uh, uh, levels and different uh, cycles of, uh, of workshops, series of workshops in order to establish an idea basically based on their thoughts and then try to figure out how to implement them. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are images just for different workshops and seminars. Next slide. Next slide. Until we figure out how to have some sort of, I guess, thank you. Until we figure out how to have an idea basically based on the youth vision. So at this stage, we implemented undergraduate students with them in order to give them or have a mutual ex exchange of skills about model making and how to draw things to just uh, have beneficial between our students and even the youth uh, to learn more from them uh, from each other. Next slide, please. So it was here right now at this stage, it was almost like at the mid of uh, the, the project. Uh, we are just having this mutual meetings between uh, our undergraduate students and the youth. Next slide, please. Up till we have like a complete vision about the street furniture that we're going to use, the design that we're going to implement, the vegetation that they're going to use. And uh, next slide. We've started to have some sort of uh, um, a, a, a hearing and gathering with the local community. So the youth themselves, actually they are located in this place. So they have uh, uh, um, some sort of presented their ideas to their parents, their uh, uh, father, uh, their uh, uh, colleagues and their uh, neighbors and try to gain their uh, consent about their ideas in order to start implementing them. Next slide, please. Also, we have presented the youth idea to the community, uh, and uh, this is uh, our partner, uh, Safadi Foundation uh, uh, partner, as well as Municipality of Elmina. They are both partners, so we have presented also the idea to the, uh, I mean, more global uh, uh, community in order to show the youth visions and ideas. Next slide, please. At this part, it was the fun part, uh, the most fun, uh, yani, interesting part for both our students and the youth because they all shared in uh, uh, designing and implementing and executing all the uh, street furniture in-house and this is part of our university and actually have correct, corrupted this part because we have used all the cement and all of the uh, wooden parts within this open area. Next slide please. And even before we have just organized the street furniture in uh, its uh, final location, the locals have started using the street furniture and they were just ask, asking more if the implementation were going to stop at this part of the city or this part only or going to be expanded along other uh, places. And they thanked us that we are providing uh, seating areas because it was really missing a uh, part from uh, this uh, area. Next slide, please. This is the phase that we are just organizing the place. Next slide. And this is almost a uh, done uh, part implementing uh, uh, a place for children to play, seating areas, reading areas. So and I'm trying to have enhanced the facades a little bit of the context and removing any parts which was not uh, um, adequate for uh, the, these type of activities. Next slide. And again, this is the final result of what's before and what's after. And actually, we have learned a lot from this project because uh, we are uh, the cooperation between the municipality, understanding the local uh, municipality uh, uh, thoughts and ideas, uh, the culture uh, foundation uh, partner, the youth, our students, the parents, the locals. So it was really multidisciplinary uh, 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 operation or trying to operate within this site and trying to uh, uh, provide the local community with a, a pleasant space that could be uh, used by youth 
and actually it might be a prototype that could be implemented in other places. Next slide, please. We thought, all right, it's of a success a little bit uh, within uh, the postgrad three years and trying to implement the undergrad with uh, 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 the local YOF. Why not implementing these issues within courses related to uh, the second or third year of uh, the architecture design? So we have just establishing our own workshops, trying to have some sort of street furniture design and implementation for them and uh, just treat the students how to buy materials, uh, uh, get the best prices, try to uh, construct them uh, into sites, try to have some sort of different uh, ideas. Next slide, please. And uh, we have just implemented a lot of undergraduate uh, workshops dealing with carpentry and all uh, uh, related stuff to have like models of scale one to one with uh, uh, to implement the students ideas. Next slide, please. We in order to uh, try to uh, document this uh, um, experience, we have searched for other Global North and trying to figure out how they, they are doing their uh, uh, design built approaches. And uh, we thought that we are, there's no technological gap between them and us, if we have them and us, if I may say, but we are actually, we're all the same issues because currently most of the schools are trying to be validated from Global North international bodies like the RIB or EBIT or NEP, and even the expanding exchange between staff and students, such as the Erasmus Plus programs and others, they're just uh, uh, filling the gap or trying to have no gap between, if I may say, Global North and Global South, and also of increasing the number of international workshops that prom promote collaboration between different universities and students at various nationalities. So based on the above discussion, the technology gap is not the issue of uh, education of or dealing with design build, but it's associated with the ability to raise funds. And actually, this is the problem. And actually, this is the, the end of our design build program in the masters. The masters continued, but using design build as uh, an idea within the masters stopped because we couldn't afford to uh, uh, self-sustain funding to this uh, uh, program in, in this way. It needs a lot of, um, we, 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 we are not uh, um, gaining a lot of fund in this. So the program of design build stopped, but it continued as assimilating uh, issues and other related issues to the masters. So it's really a problematic issue in the Global South higher education, particularly in the private architecture schools, to gain fund in order to experiment more and deal more with uh, uh, other uh, ideas. Um, next. Thank you very much and thank you for listening to my presentation or our presentation. Thank you. Um, so thank you. The um, as I said, earlier just a little reminder if you do have any questions those of you that are online please drop them in the chat so we can collect them at the end so the final um, presenter in this panel is uh, Hannah LaRue Hannah is at WITS here in um, Johannesburg but I believe is currently in Switzerland I don't know Hannah are you are you with us online super so thank you so much for um, platforming us and um, congratulations sincere congratulations this incredible book um, which is so great to see and just super inspiring in every way. Um, thank you, uh, Anna, Harriet, and Af Ashraf for all the love that you put into that. Um, so my uh, contribution to this book actually was not around the current um, pedagogy at all. Um, it intersected architectural history, some reportage on a secondary historical project, um, and um, rather reflected on a kind of prehistory, as it were, of uh, kind of anti-colonial, anti-hegemonic um, academic formation, I guess, through what is mainly a biography of um, a document, a thesis document done by um, Stanley Seitowitz, who graduated from the University of Wittstrand in 1974. So I'm just going to only read like for two and a half seconds, but um, the, the, the first few sentences of this particular uh, piece. Um, so it says the identities established in settled colonialist and apartheid pasts, 
dominate, if not define, Southern African architecture practice and its transformation today. Yet the dynamism of the current collective necessary movements towards developing anti-colonial positions in architectural education could overshadow the significant private struggles that individuals undertook earlier to extricate themselves from overbearing systems in architectural education and licensure. While the current events rescale and reflect pro uh, public instances of marginalization, they are also echoing struggles that some people bore alone. Able to enter the long tertiary education that architects require by virtue of their uh, relative privilege, these earlier, usually white figures in their diverse ways were, and sometimes still are, excluded from the normative formations embedded in professional identities. So we revisited this particular document called, um, oopsie, sorry, let me just move forward, a dissertation in 2012 as part of a um, elective research um, project with um, our honors fourth year students. Um, as a way of, sort of dissecting something historical that was really significant, not known because it was never publicly published. Um, it was only available as a kind of battered copy in our library. Um, it was also a, re a reconstruction. We, we literally remade the document. A deconstruction, as you can see from the right, uh, third image from the left, um, and a spatialization, which you can see in the kind of three-dimensionalization of this document that the students undertook. Um, in the um, um, uh, studio itself while we were while we were looking at it, this wonderful um, project of students. Um, so as a, as a consequence, we were able to break down a very complex multiple identity project into a lot of um, individual elements that had come together in this creation of um, the this dissertation, which in many ways had nothing to do with the current way dissertations are framed um, at this university. Um, if, if anything, um, this dissertation rebelled against something which is very similar to what is the status quo at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm just going to focus on a few things that he did, and particularly uh, Seitabitz's recognition of black space. So we do have to understand this is 1974. At this point, there's a complete disenfranchisement of black ownership of properties beyond um, the so-called homelands, black homelands. So everyone is effectively um, uh, a tenant or um, uh, in some way sort of uh, fugitive uh, and temporary in the, in the space that he looked at. So he begins with this kind of contrast of um, in the Bailey space, um, so this is something that there's a long tradition of architects looking at, white architects looking at in the Bailey space. Um, this is a, a group of um, food themselves. Um, I think historically we, today we would recognize them as themselves, a kind of fugitive group who were um, agriculturalists, um, but who were being raided periodically by more militant um, migratory groups, and so um, in successive waves retreated towards the sort of relative shelter of um, missions and then uh, white owned farms where they reconstructed homes, this time in a kind of hybrid way that included settler notions of recta rectangularity, but also embodied other other forms of spatialities that, that predated settlement. So um, this was a very fascinating trope for architecture academics such as Pancho Guedes, Peter Rich, um, Franco Frescuro, and so on to, to document, um, building on a much earlier history by Betty Spence and Barry Bierman in the 1940s already drawing such, such dwellings. Um, and this becomes a way through which sight of it begins to understand the kind of difference between the sort of hegemonic structure of the building per se and something much more nuanced that moves out into the landscape and that is not um, defined by buildings but by performance and also actually by gendered work. Um, he then moves towards a similar investigation but this time through photographic kind of um, stalking as it were of, of black people at work in the suburbs around his his home in Emerentia in Johannesburg. And here he's looking at black labor and life as it takes place in white space. Um, 
and he calls it architecture with the dimension of absence. Um, but what he does is he looks at the specific um, activities that are taking place and, and aligns them with the similar uh, naming function or aligns them with the naming function that one might, might take if they were formal structures, which of course they could not be. This was highly illegalized at the time. So he sees shops, he sees um, uh, hairdressers and so on ha happening. But adding on to this particular project, and here we get a glimpse of what is important about Seidewitz's work and why he's so dissenting in his relation to the expectation that he should design a building, um, is this particular image which he blows up. And what it shows in this image of a hairdresser, sort of thing that might pop up um, on the weekends when, when black men are released from their duties as gardeners and kitchen servants and laborers, is um, a man shaving another man's head. And the eroticism of this image is not incidental because at the time, Saitovitz also had a crush on his family gardener. And so the story runs through in the most subtle and almost indiscernible way through the story, through the, through the document where he speaks not directly at all of his desires, but reflects on a project that he'd done the previous year where he had wished for a doorway to be opened in the room of his bedroom, in the wall of his bedroom, to the outside, to the garden, and through which he could follow and continue to follow his friend, um, David, the, the unsurnamed uh, gardener, into his home territory of Soweto, where he, he would go on the weekends. And so we have here a kind of querying of architectural identity that cannot be spoken in 1974. And simply underscores and underlines a whole lot of other projects and work that are that are very much take apart the the family house with all its uh, repression he also takes on i would argue religious space because he was also um uh, was and remains um uh, devoutly jewish but of course um unable to be fully present in the orthodox form of judaism and so this interest in the in the church um, that takes place outside in wild spaces of Johannesburg um, on weekends, which are accompanied by trance ceremonies and baptisms and, and oral landscapes, also became something that he, I think, felt some identification with. Um, this notion of a, a form of um, spiritualism, religiosity, that was not confined by um, a kind of... Um, I guess, uh, he, he, um, orthodoxy of um, sexuality or of, uh, marriage as a kind of expectation. Um, when we look, however, at a, a kind of conclusion for this project, and I didn't write about this because I wanted to end with the document. Um, what is interesting, of course, is the fault line that happens directly afterwards. So two years after he graduated, um, he uh, drew these drawings. Um, these are images of the Brebner House, which is his so-called Transvaal House, which was built in South Africa, um, an area called Halfway House, uh, which is, in my view, a project that looks at two forms of um, African settlement. The one is the tradition of the Mutthuis, the, the way in which um, many pre-colonial uh, settlements are constructed through forms of mats put over curved structures, the saplings bent into the ground. And the second um, element is the way in which the lines of the landscape are terraced and exaggerated in order to maintain crop fertility in, in places where that's not a given. Um, and his drawings, which um, I, I presume were bought or donated to the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, so they're not in South Africa, um, show this kind of extensiveness from house into landscape. So connectivity that also shows, in my view, a kind of desire, given that they are placed at exactly the moment that sight of it decides to, to emigrate to San Francisco, a far more accepting place for, for him. And I want to also show that I have found very similar lines in aerial images like this from exactly the same period, 1976. These are the remnants of the Bailey settlement in um, the areas of the northeastern Transvaal at the time. And then um, 
looking further, however, these are images of places that themselves became threatened by the state policy at the time. So in 1976, the government was in full force um, enacting the homelands policy, which is the center, centerpiece of grand apartheid. What happens in the homeland policy is that black South Africans are not deemed resident. They have to live in these tiny reserves that are placed in either traditional black reserve land or in sort of degraded farmlands, while white farmers are given the opportunity to consolidate and buy their former um, areas of, in order to create a kind of mega scale agriculture. And so this kind of relationship with the land gets totally devastated because the new farmers use things like um, crop, you know, rotational crop spraying and so on that, that totally destroys the, the kind of relationship with the contours. And so the consequence is um, of the homelands policy is this enormous impoverishment of, of, white, of, of black South Africans and the relative wealth of some white South Africans. Um, at the same time, it also coincides with uh, a militarization of the landscape, which causes many white South Africans to um, choose to emigrate rather than joining the South African National Defense Force. So in conclusion, what we have in our dissertation is a history of an individual project that following its conclusion creates a bifurcated history. Uh, we have one story of the mobility of one gifted and dissenting individual, but we also have another history that remains behind of displaced, unsettled and deeply uh, impoverished bodies who only today are given a, a tiny but not wholesome um, opportunity to enter the university. And so when we understand the current moment of dissent, and this is from um, uh, 19, uh, sorry, 2016 protests at the University of Cape Town, where in a very kind of parallel activity to those that Seitewitz was documenting in 1974 of informal structures, uh, university students um, would uh, build Shackville on the road uh, that kind of connects the UCT campus to its hinterland. Um, this current moment, I think, um, continues to contest and to remind us that there is an ever-growing chasm um, between those who are privileged in architecture and those who are not, and the importance for the struggles to connect these communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hannah, and if I can ask, I don't know if it's possible, um, if we could pull up the kind of online, um, those who are present online, so we can see the three um, presenters. If they could turn their cameras on. That would be Patricia, Nabil, and Hannah, so that we can address questions to you. And whilst we're doing that, um, we were unfortunately unable to get Anne um, online. Uh, we, we, we could see her, but we couldn't hear her. Um, but she did send a message and she said, what an amazing honor to be here with the incredible team of authors. So I don't know if we're going to get Anne back. Again, if I could ask Hannah and Patricia and Nabil to turn their cameras on. Perfect. Wonderful. All working beautifully. Thank you. So um, I'm going to open the floor to any questions or any commentary or any thoughts or reflections that anybody here has on the presentations. Anybody like to comment on anything that they've seen or heard? Um, somebody has sent in a question into the chat. Uh, it's from uh, Oratile. And Oratile says, uh, directs us to um, Patricia. And, and she has said, it's a comment. She says, seeing how you brought three architecture schools together to work on a project is impressive. Can you talk briefly <laughs> about the school's relationships and how this benefited the students? And if so, what was the benefit? Yes, uh, thank you very much for, for the question. Hope you can, you can hear me well. Um, uh, so, so incredibly, in a small uh, Switzerland, the three schools of architecture, they are not really connected. And, uh, and it's true that um, I have the, um, the chance to meet uh, a very 
nice professor in Zurich, Annette Spiro, that she also has a lot of experience in Brazil. So you have to imagine, I don't know, Hannah, what do you think? But I think Switzerland is not uh, looking to South America. They are looking <laughs> to other places. But it's true that um, um, through some specific persons, I could uh, make this kind of platform. So the students were really happy because there are not so many exchanges between, in between the, the inside the, the university sometimes. But, uh, but as, as the beginning was not really organized, it was not very um, in the curriculum, it was very voluntary basis. It was more for the students just to come. So I just went to the universities, speak with, with the person and say, I'm launching this workshop. And, and the students were really, really motivated. So imagine, I, I, in general, I used to bring maximum 30 students to South America. And sometimes I have uh, 60 or 70 candidatures. So yes, once we were in, in Chile, for the students was amazing because they began to knew how they were learning and i think the, this idea of the platform just to to exchange knowledge also with uh, with the chilean was, was fantastic but i think it's it, it was not more i do believe in persons more than in institutions let's say it like that <laughs> i don't know if i i i answer your your question yeah, I think that's a good answer. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, there's another question from Oratile. This uh, is directed to Nabil. And Oratile asks, um, he says it's a question about funding. And he asks Nabil, I believe in the idea of learning one-to-one. -one. And to your point, it is a costly exercise, especially when you are building an actual thing to scale and not the idea. Given the challenges of student employment after graduation, what are your thoughts on monetizing this research to create income for your department and jobs for the graduates we teach? Well, actually, this is a very good comment. And um, we, at a certain problem in Lebanon, actually, currently, Lebanon is, is facing a crisis for economic crisis part. But actually, it's creating a, a way or a method to in, to uh, have some sort of a fund for the school. Yes, this is definitely needed because we need to test ideas. It's ju not just about uh, 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 yeah, I mean, models with with uh, with a scale. No, it's, with the real scale, it's really important. And uh, for uh, for a while, uh, uh, the student could afford. We can support a little bit, but at certain point we stopped because the material was really expensive. Even it was uh, local materials, and uh, uh, currently it's almost impossible in Lebanon because, as you know, that of the economic crisis. But yes, this is a good point to try to find a way to to have some sort of a fund. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much, Nabil. Um, I think those are the questions that were in the chat. So thank you to Aratila for both of those uh, very good questions. Are there any, before we, we finish this session, are there any questions from the floor anybody would like to pose? Okay, well, I'd like to thank our contributors, Hannah, Patricia, and Nabil. Uh, really good having you here. And uh, thanks for your lovely, lucid, and um, on-time presentations.